just since I was born, but uh, I'll see if I can make this share thing work again. Can you see me? Yep. Yeah. Give me a, we all set? All right, well, thank you. The, the, the topic I was asked to present was one we've done before on clinical assessment of the hip, specifically sort of a surgeon's perspective, which is uh, sort of a disclaimer that there's probably some bias in here that goes along with it. Uh, as far as, see if I can make this work. As far as disclosures, I'm a consultant, receive research support from Smith and Nephew Endoscopy. This may be the most important slide. They want to make sure we put up the credit code, which is 32022. And apparently you need to text this to the number at the, on the screen uh, within the next 24 hours. And I'll put this slide up at the end as well. So if anybody's scrambling to get it written down, uh, or if anybody shows up a little late, they can get it at the end of the lecture as well. When it comes to assessing the hip, the first question is, is it a hip problem? And that seems obvious, but back in 2001, we published the first scientific article on hip arthroscopy in athletes, and we found that 60% of intraarticular disorders went unrecognized for an average of seven months during initial treatment before they began to think whether the hip joint might be the source of their symptoms. And in, in case you think that's strictly historical data, uh, Dr. Wright's former partner, John Clohissy, published a paper where they found that young adults with non-arthritic hip disorders basically didn't need hip replacement, saw an average of 4.2 healthcare providers before a diagnosis was reached. So uh, these hip problems tend to be elusive. If you're seeing somebody with a hip problem, chances are you're not the first person they've seen. And that's an, some important background information as we go through this. Now, certainly FAI is kind of the 600 pound gorilla in the room. That's the biggest issue that we deal with. Keep in mind that regardless of the suddenness of the onset of symptoms, FAI is simply the culmination of the cumulative effect of a disorder that's been present since childhood. And that observation is important in the clinical assessment of hip disorders because they've been compensating long before the hip symptoms first developed and the compensatory problems may obscure the underlying joint issue. Now back in 2004, we published this paper looking at various diagnostic entities. And what we found is, just like they teach in medical school, your history and your physical examination are your most powerful clinical assessment tool. The problem for most of us is that nobody really taught us how to examine the hip. We sort of beat the knee and shoulder to death. But when it came to the hip, you're lucky if you got one lecture on the subject. And that's where the physical therapists are light years ahead of the orthopedic surgeons, because as orthopedic surgeons, we're kind of looking for the next operation. And before arthroscopy became popular in the hip, if somebody didn't need a hip replacement, and didn't have AVN, we quickly lost interest. And the physical therapist didn't fall into that trap because they'd just been trying to figure out how to help the patient that was in front of them. We also found in that study that a fluoroscopically guided intraarticular injection was 90% reliable. There was a, an appreciable false negative rate. And only years later, we figured out that sometimes the contrast can negate the effect of the anesthetic. But more importantly, when you talk to somebody and you send them to the x-ray department for a fluoroscopically guided injection and you ask them how much pain relief did you get, most times they're so busy telling you how horrible the experience was that it sort of tends to backfire on you. And that's where we've come to rely much more on uh, in-office ultrasound guided injections, which are far superior to fluoroscopically guided injections. This guy was mortified when we spoke about injecting his hip. He'd had two previous fluoroscopically guided injections, which is a terrible experience. Uh, when Beth Bardowski injected him in the office under ultrasound, he had this smile on his face. He nicknamed her the sniper. He was very happy. And a man who's seven feet tall and weighs 500 pounds, you don't want to have angry at you. And as far as I know, Beth has more experience with ultrasound guided injections in the hip than anybody in the history of the world. And she also is an excellent teacher. If anybody wants to learn from her, she loves to have people sort of shadow her. But basically we found from our data that ultrasound guided injections were superior and really the learning curve isn't too steep. This is just a real time example of a fluoroscopically guided injection. I just use that little ethyl chloride on the skin and just put the needle down into the joint. 
You can just watch it go right in underneath the capsule and depending on whatever you're injecting, you can see the fluid go in and lift the capsule up. She's distending the joint. And that's real time from beginning to end how long it takes to do an ultrasound guided injection in the office. Now, from my perspective, we found that this is your most useful adjunct after your history and your physical examination because it's a good day when somebody comes to see me and all they have is an isolated intraarticular hip problem. Most times they've got other coexistent or compensatory things going on. It gives you a real time assessment. Of, of their response to the injection and for diagnostic purposes. It's useful for the clinician, but oftentimes it's helpful to educate the patient on which part of their pain is coming from their joint and that pain shooting out of their right eyeball may not necessarily be coming uh, from the pathology in their hip joint. Also, asymptomatic is a relative term with the insidious way this creeps up. Oftentimes the damage is substantial before somebody realizes the joint's a problem. And sometimes you inject a joint and they go, oh, that's what a normal joint's supposed to feel like. It also helps you to establish the clinical relevance of imaging because MRI changes are the normal consequence of, of, of aging. And to paraphrase Dr. Andrews, who would talk about if you want an indication to operate on a major league pitcher's shoulder, just get an MRI, they'll all show something. I know Jed Kuhn would agree with me that if you want an indication to operate on an NHL hockey player's hip, just get an MRI because they're all going to show something. But that door swings both ways. This is the kind of case we'll do every week. A 15-year-old girl with a two-year history of progressively worsening hip pain, her mother brings her in. At this point, she's given up cheerleading and dancing. She won't go shopping because her hip hurts. She's had three stone-cold normal MRIs. She's got some radiographic features of pincer impingement but she had a positive response to an intraarticular injection. And we found the labrum is a very hardy structure. It'll sit there and get crushed by the pincer impingement literally for years before it ever tears badly enough to show up on an MRI. And in this case, we mobilize the labrum, correct the pincer lesion, then just put the labrum back where it belongs with prompt resolution over discomfort. And certainly we hope a more favorable long-term outlook. Because with these kids, it's not just a matter of trying to get them feel better, but we worry about what that means for their future. And we certainly have to be cautious about saying we're altering the natural history, but we certainly hope that we are in a positive sense. As far as the presentation, again, whether the symptoms come on acutely or insidiously, it's still a, a chronic process with FAI. Mechanical symptoms are favorable, such as locking, catching, sharp stabbing pain, but not necessary for an appropriate candidate for arthroscopic intervention. Sometimes they just have aching. Sometimes they have later repercussions. Somebody may play 18 holes of golf, and then it's that night that they, that they have discomfort with delayed onset. But be cautious about constant pain that's independent of their activities, because surgery is not going to solve some of these secondary pain patterns that can develop. And oftentimes these can develop because of the chronic nature of the process and may not mean that they don't need treatment of their hip, but you just need to make sure you're educating the patient which part you can potentially do something about. As far as characteristic exacerbation, straight plane activities are often well tolerated. We've had several people who came for surgery who ran their last marathon the weekend before and you say, why on earth are you scoping somebody's hip who can still run marathons? Well, it's because it's torsional twisting activities that are more problematic. A prolonged hip flexion such as sitting can cause hip discomfort. That throws you off because you think of problems sitting, you think of increased intradiscal pressure and back problems, but hip joint problems are exacerbated by sitting as well. Rising from the seated position, oftentimes it'll be painful if they've been sitting a long time, that first few steps, they kind of have to work the kinks out. Stairs or inclines are more problematic than level surfaces. That same athlete who can run for miles on a level surface, you put them on hills and oftentimes that's more troublesome for them. Symptoms getting in and out of an automobile as they're loading the hip in a flex position, sort of a mortar and pestle phenomenon. And oftentimes a very specific driver or passenger side. And if you learn the right questions to ask and go, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. You can gain their confidence. Because remember, if you're seeing somebody with a hip problem, chances are you're not the first person that they've seen for this. And it can be a source of frustration for them. 
dyspareunia, not in the traditional sense, but because of hip joint pain is pretty much uniformly present in all sexually active individuals. It's not something they may share with you, but it's there in pretty much all of them. If they're having problems getting their shoes and socks on and off, that implies restricted rotational motion and probably a more advanced disease process. As far as localization of symptoms, remember Hilton's law that was described 150 years ago says the same trunks of nerves whose branches supply the groups of muscles moving a joint furnish also a distribution of nerves to the skin over the insertion of the same muscles and the interior of the joint receives its nerves from the same source. This sort of helps to ensure physiologic harmony and aids in synchronous motion, but it also helps us to understand some of the muscle spasms and cutaneous sensations that can accompany a joint problem. And if you knock off some of the cobwebs from anatomy class, remember that the hip receives innervation from branches of L2 to S1 of the lumbrosacral plexus, but its principal innervation is the L3 nerve root and why symptoms may be referred to the L3 dermatome explaining the medial thigh and sometimes medial sided knee pain. Now the C sign is characteristic of hip joint pathology where they'll cup their hand above the greater trochanter gripping their fingers into the groin and you'll look at them you'll think they're describing a laterally based problem like IT band or trochanteric bursitis but they're really describing an interior hip problem. So when you see that C sign at least keep an intraarticular problem in your differential diagnosis. And actually, and, and people credit me with the C sign, but actually it was my nurse, Kay Jones, one day said, you know, have you ever noticed how these patients that kind of grip up here with these hip problems seem to describe their symptoms? And that's just an example of the power of observation. And some of the slickest scientists in the world don't necessarily possess the power of observation that can be so straightforward and can help you immensely in trying to decipher and interpret some of these problems. So we should call it the K sign, not the C sign. As far as examination, the log roll test is the most specific test as you're rotating just the femoral head in relation to the acetabulum and capsule. It's not very sensitive, but the most specific. More sensitive is gonna be the impingement test with force flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. This maneuver is normally uncomfortable, so it's important to compare the symptomatic to the asymptomatic side. And what you're looking for isn't simply whether or not it creates pain, does it, but does it recreate the type of pain that your patient or athlete experiences with activities? You may get a click or a pop or a snap, but like ankles and elbows, lots of things click and pop and snap, which may be meaningful or may not mean anything. But, and the impingement test is not specific for impingement because virtually any irritable hip is gonna be painful when you crank it over into flexion and internal rotation. Posterior impingement is infrequent, but can occur. Also, I caution you, if you see somebody who has disproportionate, painful, limited external rotation, think adhesive capsulitis. It's not common, but it can occur in the hip, especially middle-aged females. And these are the sort of things that have to hit me like a ton of bricks. Back in the late 90s, a friend of mine's wife started experiencing left hip pain. Uh, we got an MRI, suggested a labral tear, and this is back kind of in the dark ages of hip arthroscopy. You don't want to be scoping your, your, your friend's wife's hip. So I said, yeah, you know, these MRIs aren't that good. Let, you know, let's get a, a gadolinium MRI. And sure enough, it showed a labral tear as well. Injected a joint, temporary relief. Finally, I'm looking at having to operate on her hip. And I remember I got her asleep on the operating room table. I examined her hip and her hip's really stiff. And I go, oh boy, this is going to be tough. How do I get myself into this? And I'm kind of feeling it. And all of a sudden there's this cracking noise and her motion gets really good. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've fractured her femoral neck. I bring the C-arm in, I didn't break her femoral neck. I thought, well, I guess we'll move forward. And arthroscopy, all I found was all this fibrous tissue in the fossa and this little itty bitty split in the anterior labrum, which was sealed over. And I'm like, man, this isn't enough to cause her pain. She's gonna hate me. Well, she woke up and I've been her hero ever since. She just bounced back and I think she, Probably I could have just manipulated her hip and quit and, and maybe have done just as well. And subsequently, we, we published our experience with adhesive capsulitis and uh, it really shares all the characteristics in the shoulder. When you examine them, all you can tell is they just kind of hurt to move in pretty much every direction. There's a propensity for middle-aged females, diabetics and have a tougher case. And about two thirds have associated intraarticular pathology. 
many of these will respond to physical therapy. And if you scope them, you better do the manipulation first to break loose the adhesions to get distractibility of the joint. And this is what you'll encounter is just this blood field. You got to get a needle in there, clear that out. And in this case, we found a little tear, which we just smoothed over, trying not to do anything too terribly aggressive, just enough to give them pain relief and then initiate the rehab afterwards, really emphasizing range of motion right out of the blocks. Now you also need to keep in mind instability, and that's where extension, abduction, external rotation, and with anterior translative force on the femoral head uh, can accentuate symptoms of instability. And sometimes, this is a little bit in the eye of the beholder, how, how carefully you look for it. Now, assessment of the hip joint is fairly succinct. If somebody comes and spends time with me, if I'm slow and methodical, it takes me about 90 seconds to examine the hip. But examination of the hip region can be quite complex with coexistent disease, secondary disorders, and other coincidental findings. Hip and lumbar spine problems oftentimes coexist. We see this in sports, especially sports where rotational velocity is a premium. And the biggest culprits in this country are golf and baseball, and hockey is probably uh, number three right behind those. And as one of these areas breaks down, they lose their ability to compensate for the other. So as a clinician, you're chasing back and forth between the back and the hip. But if you look kind of at the whole lumbar pelvic complex, you can get your arms around these problems. Be wary of upper lumbar discs because back pain's variable. They don't have sciatica. They don't have a positive straight leg raise. They've got groin and medial thigh pain. Sometimes hip extension can exacerbate some nerve root symptoms. Piriformis syndrome is one of those disorders I think probably gets overdiagnosed and overlooked in equal proportions. There are various provocative tests for firing or re resisted contraction of the piriformis. If somebody truly has this, if you palpate the piriformis from inside the pelvis, that will light them up. And historically, we've used various types of injections. We used to use CT guided injections, which we had to send them to the x-ray department, but now we can do this under ultrasound. And here's just sort of a real-time example of a piriformis injection. Again, just ethyl chloride on the skin. You can see the piriformis sort of its trapezoidal shape. And as the needle goes in, you just put it right into the muscle belly of the piriformis and you can select where in the muscle you want to put it. You can see the sciatic nerve underneath and in this case you see the distal it being going into the muscle, the white stuff into the piriformis muscle. And again that's just a real time from beginning to end uh, that it doesn't take very long and can be done uh, with minimal discomfort to the patient. Now years ago we published our technique with open piriformis releases and now we just modified that to an endoscopic approach here in the subgluteal space. That's the sciatic nerve running horizontally in the bottom of the screen. That's the piriformis running vertically. The insertion is at the top of the screen. We'll identify the tendon. We'll resect it at the myotendinous junction and resect the distal stump of the tendon. And then we'll free the muscle up all the way back to the sciatic knots just to make sure that the nerve is free all the way up to the, to the notch. And there's the nerve running transversely on the bottom of the screen, freed up to the notch. Now, other coexistent disease, core muscle injuries or athletic pubalgia sort of has an identity crisis, gets called a lot of different things, but it's easy to understand how that coexists with hip problems because with reduced hip range of motion is compensated by increased pelvic motion, which puts more stress on the pelvic stabilizers and breakdown in those structures. And that's where your core muscle injuries come in. But to show you that the hip has influence much further up the kinetic chain, when we looked at high level baseball players, we found that 75% of the major league pitchers that we were operating on their hip also had ulnar collateral ligament surgery in their elbow. And that's a high number. And I, I would like to tell you that they all had elbow surgery before we corrected their hip problem, but half of them were before and half of them were after. For those we did after operating on their hip, you could argue that maybe they were having some subconscious residual hip problems, compensating for it, putting more stress on their elbow or maybe because we made their hip feel so good that they were able to deliver more force to their elbow. I prefer the second theory, but the bottom line is we don't know. It's just an observation that we've made. As far as other coexistent disease, I think pelvic floor disorders have been largely overlooked. We're trying to understand these better. The anatomic connection is evident, but the clinical connection with hip disorders has been less well-defined. 
other secondary disorders, the glutes may be overfiring and painful and you push on and say, oh, you got glute tendonitis, which may obscure the joint problem. Or the glutes may be underfiring, causing overfiring of the iliopsoas and the hamstrings. There's all these things that can be going on. You could spend an hour in the office trying to decipher these things. And that's where the physical therapists are really astute at being able to dissect these things out, compartmentalize it, identify the various features, but oftentimes identify the sequencing of what's going on. Because a lot of this, like most things in life, timing's everything. Correcting the sequencing is just important as, as just saying, oh, you just need to get stronger. There's a lot more to it. Now, trochanteric bursitis or recalcitrant trochanteric bursitis, to me, I think is equivalent to the pre-arthroscopy era biceps tendonitis in the shoulder. I don't know if there's anybody on this meeting that was familiar with the pre-arthroscopy era of biceps tendonitis, but before the arthroscope, all the anterior shoulder pain, ah, you got biceps tendonitis. But with the arthroscope, we realize that isolated biceps tendonitis is infrequent. We see slap tears, undersurface rotator cuff tears, subscap, a lot of things, but usually not just an isolated biceps tendonitis. And that led to the term greater trochanteric pain syndrome, which although less specific is probably more accurate for describing the constellation of things that can present as laterally based hip pain. Now I think a lot of that recalcitrant um, laterally based pain falls under the abductor tendinopathies. We know about the positive Trendelenburg sign where you raise the contralateral leg. If your abductors are weak, the pelvis is gonna to drop to that side. We know about the Trendelenburg gait or the abductor lurch that if your abductors are weak in the stance phase, the pelvis might drop. But what happens is they just shift the trunk over the symptomatic side so the abductors aren't having to work as hard to maintain uh, ambulation. With differential palpation, if you know the anatomy, you can identify various structures. Uh, differential strength testing with the knee flexed, you're isolating the gluteus medius and abduction. Uh, with an extension, you're recruiting the IT band. And if you flex the hip, you're bringing the gluteus maximus into play. Ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections can have diagnostic and therapeutic value. Now, I used to run the other way from laterally based hip pain because I thought they were old people, they're miserable, and they're hard to sort out. But I figured out only two of those three things are true. They are an elderly population. They are severely disabled, but they're not that difficult to sort out. This is the first case I ever did, sort of kicking and screaming. An orthopedic surgeon I'd operated on sent this gal to me. She's 68 with a big abductor tear. I would have sent him to Brian Kelly up at HSS. He said, you'll operate on me, why won't you operate on my patient? So finally I said, okay. And I remember talking to her saying, lady, if you just won't fuss at me, I'll try. And this is my very first abductor repair. And for the shoulder surgeons, if it's just kind of like a rotator cuff going sideways, we used a double row fixation, three transversely oriented proximal row and knotless distal row, and it worked. And then subsequently over time, sort of begrudgingly, I, I collected a few of these cases. And with our two year follow-up, we found out that with the abductor repairs, when we compared them to our previous published data on FAI, we found that these patients were 20 years older than FAI patients. They were pretty much all females. Their preoperative baseline modified Harris hip scores were 20 points worse than our FAI patients. But their amount of improvement was double that what we saw with the FAI. This really dispels a couple of myths about hip arthroscopy. Number one, that older patients don't do well with hip arthroscopy. This is one of the most successful populations that we see. And also that low preoperative baseline scores are an indicator of poor outcomes. But these patients are severely disabled and can do exceptionally well. Other coincidental findings, the snapping hip syndromes. And I tell people that if you can hear it from across the room, it's the iliopsoas tendon. And if you can see it from across the room, it's the iliotibial band. And with that, you'll diagnose 90% of all snapping hip syndromes without ever laying a hand on the patient. It's the other 10% that are gonna challenge your diagnostic acumen. With the snapping iliopsoas, it occurs as the tendon flips across the front of the joint of the pectineal eminence. Sometimes there's a bifid tendon, and it's just a tendon flipping back and forth on itself. The classic exam maneuver is going from flexion, abduction, external rotation down into extension with internal rotation. Oftentimes, this is something patients can demonstrate to you better than you can elicit on exam. 
it's variable, sometimes standing, sometimes sitting, sometimes lying down. But what's consistent is the clunking almost always occurs going from flexion to extension, not the other way around. The symptoms emanate from the groin, so it can be confused with a hip joint problem or coexist with hip joint problems. There's various imaging, none of which is completely reliable. Differential injections can help, but again, they're not conclusive because there's a certain amount of communication between the iliopsoas bursa and the joint. Bill Allen from Missouri uh, originally described this open fractional lengthening with good success. They had a lot of complications, most of which were just superficial sensory problems. Now, about 15 years ago, we described our endoscopic technique, releasing it from the lesser trochanter. Uh, we had 100% success and, and, and no complications. This is that technique using a, a flexible RF device to release the tendon from the lesser trochanter. It's a very easy place to get to, slight flexion, external rotation, release the tendon. Well, as somebody once mentioned, nothing ruins good results like follow-up. We subsequently had a, observed three cases of heterotopic ossification, each progressively worse than the one before. And taking this stuff out is not fun. So I really didn't want to see that anymore. And about that time, a friend of mine, a surgeon Michael Deans from Germany, described releasing the iliopsoas from the peripheral compartment. And we adopted that technique. We've not seen HO with release from the peripheral compartment. I don't know if it's because of the technique where we divide the myotendinous junction or whether it's because we're also prophylaxing with the non steroidal anti inflammatory medicine. Either way, I don't care. I just don't want to see it again. Now you can actually release, uh, do a fractional lengthening from the central compartment, extending your capsulotomy further medially. But if you do this from the central compartment, I think it's important to look from the peripheral compartment when you get done. Here's a case where we're dividing the tendon from the central compartment. We think we've done a great job. And then we go to the periphery and we realize, wait a second, there's a whole nother band of this tendon. There are uh, a bifid tendon and other bands. So always look from the peripheral compartment if you're going to choose to release it from the central compartment. Now snapping of the iliotibial band isn't something you're going to confuse with a hip joint problem, but this is the patient walks into your office says, look doc, my hip's dislocating. They'll stand up there and move around and do these gyrations and it'll look for all the world like hip dislocating, but you can x-ray the hip in any position you want to. The hip's concentrically reduced it's just the tensor fascia lata flipping back and forth across the greater trochanter. There are various tests looking for tightness of these structures. Surgical correction for snapping of the IT band is rarely indicated. Uh, there is a sophisticated Z-plasty technique that's been described and I encourage you to stay away from this operation because it's a complex procedure for a fairly simple problem. A number of years back, we described an open procedure with this modified cruciate incision to just kind of Relax the IT band over the greater trochanter. You don't have to sew anything together. You're not waiting for suture lines to heal. It facilitates the early post-operative rehabilitation. And then we just modified that to an endoscopic approach. And this viewing from anterior, that's the vastus lateralis. This is the deep surface of the IT band. We're doing our modified cruciate incision in sort of advanced time. And that's literally all it takes. Now, whether you do this open or endoscopic, if you don't do an adequate release, you may not solve the patient's problem. But if you do an excessive release of the IT band, that's potentially an unsalvageable or certainly a, a salvage situation. So this is a simple operation, but it's critically important that you do it with precision. Now, there are snapping that's not the iliopsoas and not the iliotibial band, and that's where we've learned a little bit about ischial femoral impingement. Uh, this was actually first described in, in the radiology literature. And I remember I had a patient with this, so I called the, the senior author and they said, well, how do these patients do? And said, well, we don't know. We just reported on the observation. So I, I think that as a surgeon, we want to be wary of pursuing innovative surgical techniques for a problem that's only been described in the radiology literature. It's skipping a few basic tenets, namely your history, your physical exam, understanding of the pathomechanics, conservative treatment and outcome. But with this ischial femoral impingement, probably the, the most classic thing is this grating sensation like knuckles going across a washboard. If anybody remembers what a washboard is, when they're walking, it occurs at the end of the stance phase of gait, which is when the hip's extending. So it can kind of make you think maybe it's the iliopsoas tendon 
but it's not. It's usually a, a deeply situated pain. It's kind of more posterior than anterior, but oftentimes the patients have a difficult time telling you exactly where it's coming from. Uh, MRI show edema and cystic changes in the quadratus from amoris. You look for narrowing of the ischial femoral space between the ischium and the lesser trochanter. The first cases I saw had normal ischial femoral spaces. A uh, response to ultrasound or CT guided injections is variable because it's not a very well-contained space. I would occasionally offer surgery for this. And I remember the very first one I ever had about the same time, Mark Safran, who's chief of sports medicine out at Stanford had a case and he was gonna resect the lesser trochanter, which I didn't think was a good idea in my case because number one, the space was normal and I didn't see any reason to go pick on the insertion of the iliopsoas, which was intact if it was a quadratus femoris that was getting beat up. So we had a handful of these cases that we just resected the quadratus femoris and the results ranged from okay to no good at all. So it wasn't a, wasn't a great operation in my hands. And then this gal shows up and this was actually my first endoscopic iliopsoas release from a decade earlier, comes back and her popping's back and I examine her and it acts like it's, she's got ischial femoral impingement, but she thinks it's her iliopsoas. She's got a little edema in her quadratus femoris. So I thought, okay, we'll resect the lesser troke because that'll address it if it's the iliopsoas or the ischial femoral space. So I went in and here we are just exposing the lesser troke. This is hard bone. Usually you'll go through a couple of burrs resecting the lesser troke, but it solved her symptoms. And I don't like doing this operation, but the one operation that's worked for recalcitrant cases is resection of the lesser troke. Now, I'll just spend about seven minutes or so talking about imaging, then kind of leave time for questions and answers. Certainly, x-rays are important. And it's amazing how x-rays kind of fell by the wayside until FAI came along, because everybody's really looking at MRIs and stuff. But with FAI, we realize the importance of understanding the morphology. You want a properly centered AP pelvis view. I think everybody agrees on that. But what do you do if the, you get an AP pelvis and it's not properly centered? Do you go back and hold the, the x-ray tech's hand and try to get it just right? To me, as long as it's reasonably centered, I'll go ahead and accept it. And then as I'm assessing various indices, I'll just try to account for the fact that if there's some rotational malalignment. Now, do you need to get a supine or standing? Well, we'll routinely get a supine that God's makes the argument that's a position we operate on people. The, Standing x-rays are a little more challenging to get correct orientation. I think where the standing x-rays help you the most are in people who have dysplasia or potential instability problems, because it does help you to appreciate the orientation of the pelvis in space when they're standing, because the, the, the version of the acetabulum changes substantially. Now the lateral view is usually obtained to assess the cam morphology and the epicenter of the cam lesion is variable. So there's no single lateral x-ray that's best for everybody. We'll just get a frog lateral. And the reason I get a frog lateral is it's been shown to be a, a good image. Remember this isn't a lateral of the hip joint, it's just a lateral of the proximal femur. And the main thing, it's easy to get a reproducible x-ray. So you're able to interpret it the same way every time. On average, the 45 degree done view is probably gonna catch the epicenter of the cam lesion more often, but it's a little trickier to get a good done view. So again, if it's not quite right, do you send them back and keep shooting more images? And, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Now the cross table lateral is a true lateral, but we rarely ever get a cross table lateral. Uh, it doesn't give you that much more information and it takes a lot of radiation exposure for penetration to get a cross table lateral. Now the false profile is really outside of the pelvis and frog lateral is in occasionally weight bearing view is my go-to view. Uh, it can help you to look at anterior coverage, dysplasia and over coverage. You can look at the subspine morphology, but probably more importantly in my hands, when you see somebody where you're worried about degenerative disease, joint space narrowing, this is just a typical example of a couple of 50 something year old gals, both with right hip pain and their AP pelvis doesn't look that bad. But on the frog lateral, you can appreciate the anterior joint space narrowing in the top view and the posterior joint space narrowing in, in the bottom example, showing you this is somebody that you don't need to bother to try to scope their hip just to, to have a disappointed patient. This is somebody who's better served by an arthroplasty. 
you know, I tend to be a minimalist on the x-rays because again, all the x-rays give you these two-dimensional images trying to interpret the complex three-dimensional three anatomy of the hip. It's kind of like sort of trying to interpret tea leaves with the x-rays. And that's where the 3D CT scan eliminates the guesswork. And I tend to save my radiation exposure on x-rays, keep that to minimum for the 3D CT scans. We have low-dose protocols that report to be the equivalent of five hip x-rays. I don't think anybody knows for sure, so I certainly don't blow it off, say no big deal, but we don't get CT scans as part of a routine workup. But if we've got somebody, we've made the decision we're gonna operate on them and we're thinking that bony correction or bony architecture may be a factor, then we'll get the 3D CT scan. Now, as far as MRIs, uh, they may incompletely define what's going on in the hip, but they're important to assess for disorders that arthroscopy we may not detect or may contraindicate arthroscopy, such as stress fractures, AVN tumors, transient regional osteoporosis, just to mention a few. Now, as far as MRI standards, I think for the hip, it's gotta be at least a 1.5 Tesla magnet with dedicated surface coils. 3T magnets may be a little beneficial for bigger patients, but a 1.5 is usually adequate. You want some large field of view images and then some dedicated small field of view images as well. Now, as far as gadolinium arthrography, it may give you a little better sensitivity, especially for suboptimal scanners. Uh, there's some potential for false positive interpretations. We always inject anesthetic along with the contrast. And as we noted before, because uh, injecting anesthetic is, is more important as far as assessing the clinical relevance of what's going on. And that's where gadolinium MRIs do have some caveats, because once you inject contrast, you lose the ability to see whether there's any effusion because sometimes a little bit of an asymmetric effusion may be the only thing you see. The contrast can obscure the presence of underlying subchondral and soft tissue edema. And there's ample experience that the contrast can negate the effect of the anesthetic. Uh, and, and I know, as, I think there's a comment in here that I think some people worry about toxicity of the, of the gadolinium. Now, this is just an example. The left-hand view is a post-contrast image, it shows a labeled tear, but is that a labeled cleft or a tear? Well, on the pre-contrast images on the right, you can see the amount of effusion, which tells you this patient was clearly in trouble, that you wouldn't, you can't tell that from the post-contrast images. These are just a couple examples of pre-contrast images showing subchondral changes on the coronal and sagittal images. And on the post-contrast images, you can kind of see where the lesion is, but it's nowhere near as evident. As far as intraarticular findings, MRIs are best at showing label tears and less reliable at showing articular damage, lesions to the ligamentum teres. A paralabral cyst is pretty much pathognomonic. If you see a paralabral cyst, there should be a label tear somewhere. Now, anterior label tears are most common because most of these are associated with FAI. The tearing begins anterior and then works laterally from there. Uh, and the anterior label tears are best seen on the sagittal and oblique axial images. And if you have a radiology department where they're trying to skimp on imaging to speed business through, the ones they tend to skip are the sagittal and oblique axial. So you wanna make sure they get those uh, views for you. Now, lateral label tears can sometimes just be an extension of an anterior label tear. And sometimes it can be a normal cleft like this. And if you're trying to tell, is it a cleft or a tear? Most times I'll look at the anterior labrum because if the anterior labrum's normal, then laterally that's probably a cleft because the tearing usually begins anterior and works laterally. Now the exception to that is with dysplasia where the tearing will begin laterally and there's usually some element of hypertrophy. Posterior labral tears really just are an extension of what's going on anteriorly. Often there's a generous posterior cleft. So most times if you see an MRI report that says there's a posterior labral tear, just assume that's probably a cleft. Now, one thing to be aware of is posterior rim fractures are oftentimes interpreted as a posterior label tear on MRI because this is hard cortical bone. You don't get bony edema that you would expect to see a lot of edema with the posterior rim fracture, but oftentimes that's simply not present. MRIs are less predictable assessing the severity of articular damage, subchondral edema, and cystic changes are oftentimes important indirect signs that the articular surface is getting into trouble. For me, I just assume the articular damage is gonna be worse than what the MRIs show. 
And I tell the patients that that's the wild card. That's a part we just won't know for sure until the time of arthroscopy. So you're not getting lulled to, oh, it's just a label pair and get in there and find out there's something more going on that may negatively influence the outcome. The Jamrick MRI and a variety of other techniques are coming to the forefront of being able more sensitive at assessing chondral damage. I think this will become important in the future as we get normative data so we can start to predict, you know, when has somebody's hip sort of exceeded the point that corrective surgery is no longer going to potentially be beneficial for. Now you'll see reports of high MRI predictability, sensitivity, and specificity, but most of us aren't going to see that in our practices. And, and, and I think MRIs are as much helpful for what they rule out as they are what they rule in. Certainly need to be cautious about false positives, but otherwise uh, just keep in mind they tend to incompletely detect the extent of the intraarticular pathology. So just to bring closure to this and open it up for questions, uh, evaluation in hip and groin disorders really isn't that hard. It does require an understanding of the anatomy and pathomechanics, keeping in mind that different problems can have similar appearances and may coexist. Your history and your physical examination are still your most powerful clinical investigative tools. The arthroscope has greatly enhanced our understanding of hip joint pathology, but it's also forced us to gain an understanding of some of the disorders around the joint as well. So thank you very much. Now I'll go back to the most important slide and, and uh, sort of throw it open to questions or comments. Uh, I have a quick question, Dr. Bird. Uh, thanks as usual first. And then second, uh, you talked about uh, false positives on the hip MRI, but early in the talk, you also talked about false negatives. And uh, how often do you see these false negatives, uh, you know, normal MRIs and, and have the labrum be, be part of the problem? Um, quite frequently, and, and I think, Mostly we tend to lay blame as false negatives on the articular damage and keeping in mind that commonly the MRI underestimates the severity of the articular damage. So how much underestimation is a false negative? But I just sort of assume that it's gonna underestimate that and may incompletely show the severity of the labral damage. And that's where the, the, the MRI sequencing that we get may not be perfect. There may be other sequences you can get, but I'm so used to interpreting my studies, knowing what it shows me, but also understanding what it doesn't show me. They, and, and just like, as you know, with knees and shoulders, you have to get to where you're looking at them yourself and not just looking at the report. I tell people, I read the reports just kind of for entertainment value. That sounds good, thanks. Could you address the um, sort of trend we're seeing where uh, non-symptomatic FAI is being addressed, usually in, a, in an opposite hip. So you have a symptomatic hip and it's addressed and then addressing that in an asymptomatic hip. And, and, and I think hopefully we haven't crossed that threshold where people are getting enthusiastic about recommending uh, surgery on an asymptomatic hip. As we always say, it's awfully hard to make somebody feel better who's asymptomatic, but, but certainly there's a lot of concern there. And that's the biggest question is what do you do about the person who has imaging evidence? And normally if you've got imaging, that means that something must have been bothering them. So you sort of got to dive into that, that if they got imaging, they're already pre-selected that something's going on, but it's not uncommon that with, with the imaging, you may get a little peek at the other hip and realize there's trouble brewing with the other hip that's entirely asymptomatic. Well, the, the things that I tell somebody are, are, if their other hip's not bothering them, I, I wouldn't jump into surgery. But I think it does warrant being watchful. And if, if they're starting to become symptomatic, then maybe you don't want to just wait until it gets as bad as the other side. Now, usually that means that you're operating on the other side. So I tell them, any decisions we make about your other side are gonna be determined by how satisfied you are with what we've accomplished on the first side. And it's not uncommon that people, once their symptomatic side gets to feeling better, they go, yeah, well, I didn't realize they're gonna feel that good. Yeah, this one is bothering me. I think I'm ready to do something. I think it's important to be watchful. Just like similarly, if you've got an athlete in season who's had enough symptoms to get looked into and they've got FAI, 
do you rush in and operate on them and knock them out for the next four to six months? And the best I can tell somebody is it's unlikely that the problems are gonna get worse and them not know it. So if the symptoms are stable, I'm okay by taking a watchful approach. Now, one of the most important things I emphasize to people is not recommending surgery doesn't mean that it's not a problem because I've had people who had appropriate conservative treatment, then it failed and they needed surgery and they come to me and they go, man, they just tried that injection or had me doing therapy and now I need surgery. That, so just because you're not recommending surgery, that's where it's so critical with athletes to have them in the loop on what's going on. I kind of got away from your question. I hope I answered it a little bit. No, thanks. Um, Dr. Bird, um, this is Rebecca. I'm a physical therapist. Can you talk a little bit about sort of your cutoff for severity on whether you are trying physical therapy prior to surgery? If ever, by the time they get to you, that might be um, a moot point. And, and then at the same time, if you have sent somebody to therapy, sort of when you would want to hear back from that therapist for red flags that you need to see them again. And I would say probably the, the, the simple majority of patients that get referred to me with a hip problem need more therapy. And, and, and that's a challenge because people don't come see me because they want more therapy. They'll usually go, oh, I don't want surgery, but you came to see the surgeon. So in the back of their mind, they came there ready to get signed up for surgery to get this behind them, get the problem well and get it behind like somehow surgery is going to magically fix everything. Uh, so it's quite a sales job to convince them that there's a lot of things we can be working on in the front end. Now, I train with Dr. Andrews and, and I understand the importance of prehab and all that stuff, but I used to be kind of the thinking, you know, FAI is FAI. What's therapy going to do for FAI? So. I mean, if I was that small minded, I, I can't blame anybody else for being that way as well. But certainly we know that there's a lot you can do from a therapy standpoint with pelvic stabilization to reduce the forces across the hip. So I tell people your, your only choices aren't suck it up or do surgery. There are things we can do from a non-surgical standpoint to reduce the forces. You can't change what they do on, on the football field or the baseball diamond or, or on the ice but you can sure change what they're doing with their workout programs and training programs. You can modulate things. So sometimes you can at least do some damage control to at least get them to a point that it's better for surgeon. And just like anything else we see these, and, and as I said in my talk, to see somebody who just has an isolated intraarticular hip problem is rare because they've always got some other stuff going on. So you just have to assess the quantity of how much other stuff is going on. And some are, are such a, mess, they need all that other stuff worked on just to get them in a better position for the surgery to potentially be successful. And that's where we're, we're, we're pretty liberal about single time uh, trying cortisone injection. Because if, and if all you do is just shoot some cortisone in there and pat them on the back, they may feel better for a little bit. But the purpose is, if we can get the joint quieted down, then there's more you can accomplish from a rehab standpoint. And especially most of the people who come to us have had two or three courses of physical therapy that never made any difference for them. And you don't want to just retrace the same steps, but oftentimes they're getting them to buy in that. So sometimes the injection is part of the getting them to buy into the therapy strategy. Does that answer it at all? Yes, thank you. And I would say most people are going to get some sort plus most people need some sort of attention on the front end, even if it's only to educate them about what else is going on to prepare them for what they're going to need afterwards. Yeah. So my biased ears heard that most people need therapy before surgery. I, I, and, and yes, they, they can definitely benefit <laughs> from it. And, you know, so, and occasionally you'll see somebody, they just, their joint bothers them, everything around the hip is strong, they're ready to go. But I always, the, the hardest thing to describe for somebody is the recovery process afterwards. So anything you can do to kind of make them, give them more awareness on that is a plus. Thank you. Dr. Bird, that was a great lecture. Um, I appreciate your insights into that. I, I was a little bit curious. Um, I, I trained with Brian Kelly, so um, I saw he was only doing the open repairs of the hip abductors. 
And and I'm curious what your experience is like uh, open versus arthroscopic. And then the other part of that question is when, when I see these patients, it's not very often that they recall an event or something when they developed their uh, gluteus medius tear. You know, sometimes there's like a precipitous decline, but a lot of times it's not super obvious. For, for the patients that don't have like a lot of atrophy, do you, do you consider still putting them in therapy? I, like, I, you know, I saw a patient this week who's uh, mid seventies, very active, and she's had a bunch of injections historically, but at kind of a precipitous decline, really hasn't done any exercises. And so I'm looking at the muscle, I'm like, well, may, you know, probably won't hurt to do some therapy beforehand. But at the same time, I, I you know, I, I, I'm curious what, whether you, you feel like, you know, it's just better to go in and fix them once you identify the tear because it's, it's, they're, they're less likely to improve. So kind of twofold question on how, how you rehab once you've identified a tear, if you do any, and then, and then your open versus arthroscopic approach and what, what, you, what you've learned from your experience with both. And there's a lot of important messages in those two questions that most abductor tears that are amenable to surgery are in older people. And, and you're right, they may have an episode, oh, I stepped wrong getting off the uh, ladder in the kitchen or something, but it, it wasn't a healthy tendon that tore. There's some underlying attrition and wear and tear. You get an MRI, show some abductor tendon pathology, but who knows how much of that may have already been there the day before they had this acute event. So almost always there's a role for conservative treatment. It, it's very difficult to envision a role for saying, no, oh, you just need surgery on your hip. Now, the exception to that might be a young person who pulls their tendon off, but I've never seen that. Young people, the people don't tear the emphasis of the tendon unless there's a disease process, and that disease process is usually associated with age. Young people tear at the myotendinous junction, and that will pretty much uniformly heal without surgery. That's why we're just not doing, because you could kind of envision, just like a young person with the rotator cuff tear, there's some of those that you might say, you know, it's probably better just to bite the bullet and get this thing fixed. But, and, and I'm sure there would be one out there somewhere, but I've just never seen one yet. So most times, you know, there's some underlying attrition. Uh, so yes, there's a role for conservative treatment. I've seen folks with all kinds of horrible looking abductors who had some symptoms, got better. And, and the best example, I don't think he would mind me telling you, was Angus McBride, who's this wonderful foot and ankle surgeon he was about 70 something years old, had this extensive abductor tendon damage he sent me, he had an injection, rehabbed it, got back to running 10 Ks and all that kind of stuff, tragically died in a car wreck a couple of years ago. But there's just bunches of examples where if you do an MRI, everybody over the age of 70, you'll see all kinds of abductor tendon damage. So the role of conservative treatment is real. It's a challenging group because a lot of these have had numerous injections by their family doctor or other people just kind of trying a shot and then when it gets it doesn't work and, and injections are not the sole form of conservative treatment sometimes it's worthwhile to get the therapist work with them a big part of it is figuring out how hardy is the patient are they up for the rehab process because to me abductor repairs are the most arduous recovery there is uh, I tell people it takes four months for the tendon to heal. And my nurse Kay says, don't ever mention the word four months to anybody. Tell them it's going to take at least six months before they feel like it's worthwhile going through. It's just a long drawn out recovery. Now, we've had plenty of 70 plus year olds and a couple of 80 year olds who are active and the quality of their life is so poor that we've done the surgery and they can do quite well. So, so much of that just goes into picking a patient who's who's up for the rehab and the recovery. Now, as far as endoscopic or open approach, uh, it's interesting because Brian is the one who put endoscopic repair on the map and he doesn't do endoscopic repairs anymore. He does them open because you can sure do it quicker on, on an open basis, uh, but it, uh, endoscopically you can do them on an outpatient basis. Also, most of these are older patients. Usually there's some amount of coexistent intraarticular pathologies. I think one of the biggest advantages of the endoscopic approach is it allows you the luxury of addressing whatever may be going on in the hip joint as well. To me, I have to have a compelling reason not to look in the hip if I'm doing an abductor repair. It's just like you wouldn't go into the subacromial space and do a rotator cuff repair without at least looking in the glenohumeral joint. So 
that's probably the, the biggest deal with the endoscopic or outpatient ability to assess for intraarticular damage. Large, massive tears, the, the open techniques are excellent. So just because you can't fix it endoscopically, uh, the, the, the open techniques are, are really quite good. Thank you, that's very helpful. Well, I know it's getting close to that witching hour. Thanks, Tom. That was a fantastic overview. Well, this is fun. I appreciate y'all including me and, and um, look forward to doing it again. Well, we'll have to pick uh, Alex Brown for some of his wisdom in the future. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.